We now want to move on to the marquee conversation today between Wade and Sachin entitled Converging on Sustainability. Uh, and just have one logistical note before we launch into that. If you would like to pose questions during uh, that conversation, there should be a box on your screen. Uh, if Please feel free to use them and post the questions. The only request is please make the questions uh, short. Um, we'll try and get to several of them at least, uh, given the time constraints. We may not get, and likely will not get to all of them depending on, on the amount. So with that said, uh, in the spirit of opportunity in these changing times, as Jonathan alluded to at the top of this gala, we are pleased to have the opportunity to pivot to Ryan McDonald, Canada's leading journalist in sustainability, to moderate this marquee conversation. And Ryan is the Globe and Mail Senior Editor for Climate, Environment, and Resources. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ken. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, gracias por la invitación. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm excited to talk about sustainability with Wade and Sachin. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. We're in a fascinating time uh, coming out of a pandemic. We have nothing but opportunity ahead of us. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to kick off the discussion by um, posing the question to, to both Wade and Sachin, I think in that order, we'll start with you, Wade. Uh, how, do you, how do you define this term, sustainability? What, what does it mean to you? I mean, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure there's a precise definition, but it's one of those things, Ryan, that I think we, we all recognize it when we see it, if we can't necessarily define it in terms that are, are consistent across the entire economic and political and social spectrum. You know, I, I, I think it's all about redefining what what we see as ultimately the value. I mean, one of the fascinating things that has come out of the conflict in Colombia, as the president alluded to, is that because of the conflict, vast areas of Colombia were literally off limits for any kind of economic development. Uh, and whereas neighboring states, for example, Ecuador, that made certain decisions 50 years ago, about the development, for example, of the Oriente with um, uh, oil exploitation, pipelines, colonization, leading to deforestation. Um, uh, Colombia now is facing those same decisions, but having been informed by 50 years of understanding of the importance of biodiversity and the environment, um, not just simply as mainstays of the biosphere, but also of symbols of national uh, patrimony. And so Colombia is in this remarkable situation uh, where it's now making decisions informed by science over areas of land that remain pristine. I mean, it's quite astonishing to think that the Amazon in Colombia, uh, which is the size of France, uh, remains, although under threat today, perhaps, uh, essentially roadless. And so Colombia is sort of making these decisions uh, with a level of awareness informed by science, which is very, very, I think, hopeful. And that is in good part because the country has remarkable infrastructure when it comes to uh, universities and science and incredible um, uh, cadre. It's always, Colombia's always been a center of science in Latin America. And that's all coming together with people like President Santos, whose last act in office, by the way, was to double the size of what was already one of Latin America's largest national parks, the National Park at Chiribiquete. So I think, I think that's really a very, very hopeful um, view to the future. I definitely want to get back to biodiversity, but I also want to have uh, Sachin have an opportunity to speak here as well. Uh, Wade is, I would say, is looking at uh, sustainability both from an ecological standpoint and a uh, an economic standpoint. Do you do you share that view? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, you know, when we have invested in the country, uh, I use that term social license uh, to operate. We have used that word well before terms like sustainability or renewables or climate change were being thrown around. I think as business people, we looked at it more like if we were working with the community, the government, the education institutions, um, in coming up with solutions that people need to 
move people and goods around the country and to create economic infrastructure, it was a balancing act that we were always trying to obtain. And to us, if we could balance it well with the community's interests and the broader community, I don't mean just the local community, but also the government, the regulators, uh, economic and educational institutions, uh, then we felt like we would have that social license and that would endure much more so than just a, a short-term outcome that we were promoting. And, um, and we've always approached our business around the world, really, in that regard. Um, but I think what Dr. Davis is getting at is one clearly very important part of that social license. Fantastic. I, I, I think we've, we've now de defined the term sustainability and, uh, and uh, we've had one question that's not dealt with the issue of, of the pandemic that we find ourselves in, but I do want to deal with that in the context of sustainability. Um, and I think it's an important one to consider in context uh, because COVID-19, I think, has offered a kind of a leveling up as a species. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are, Wade, around the pandemic and the opportunities that, um, that are presented around sustainability and specifically how leadership have factors into this discussion. We've got to, we probably have a lot of leaders here in terms of uh, business leaders and, and uh, government leaders and, other, and others. So I'd, I'd like to try and get at that issue of leadership. I think it's really important. We've heard from President Santos. What are your views on that? Well, on leadership or COVID, Ryan? Uh, Leader, uh, leadership in the context of COVID and well, the opportunity. I think, I, think leadership, you know, I, I think one of the things we need to be <clears throat> is, is patient. You know, his, we're always uh, uh, impatient with the pace of history and social change. But it's happening all around us. You know, within my lifetime, women have gone from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the closet to the altar. I mean, what's not to love about a world capable of such social movements, if you will. And uh, one of the things I, I, if I ever get impatient, is with people on the environmental side who like to sort of uh, paint entire sectors of the economy with the same stroke of the brush, which is not only sort of silly, it's also unhelpful. And I'll just share one wonderful story. I was giving a, a major lecture, uh, the Tate Lecture at SMU in Dallas, uh, and I was speaking about, as an anthropologist about shamanism, about ayahuasca, about uh, traditional uh, healing techniques or whatever it was. And afterwards, the president of SMU called me at midnight and said there was a supporter who'd like to meet me. Uh, of the university. And I said, great, happy. So the next morning I meet this small little Texan, uh, short man, whose first words to me uh, were, Wade, I didn't understand everything you had to say last night, but I got a little bitty project in Peru. My name's on this company, my son's name's on this company. We want to do it right. And we think you can help us do it right, son. Well, that little bitty project was the biggest foreign investment in the history of Peru. And I was speaking to Ray Hunt, owner of the largest private energy company in the world. And his little project was a $3 billion LNG and, and pipeline Camasilla project. And I was so enchanted by his insincerity that I went back to Washington, called up Tom Lovejoy, who invented the term with Ed Wilson, biodiversity. And I said, Tom, you've got to join me. And we became with Malcolm Gillis, the ex-president of Rice, the advisory panel that Hunt needed to work with the multilateral banks. And I can promise you that 15 years later uh, or 10 years later uh, in Dallas, Tom called, to, leaned over to me and whispered into my ear in a meeting with the Hunt family and, and their team, uh, thank you for getting me into this because in 10 years, they not only did it right, they spent millions of dollars in environmental mitigation they didn't have to do. And they built a pipeline project that was absolutely exemplary. And, and that really, really struck me that, that if you have faith in good people and good people who can be found in every sector of every element of our economy, let's let them shine, if only so that those who may be guilty of less uh, admirable practices will be shamed either, either morally or legally into emulating the best practices of the good people who are leading the way toward a sustainable future. Uh, Sachin, how does how does Brookfield get it right? How, do, how does Brookfield make sure? I mean, we've got a, a, a massive opportunity here. The world does. Uh, Brookfield deals with uh, with infrastructure, renewable energy projects. How does Brookfield get it right on the sustainability front in terms of that leadership quality? Yeah, I think we start with uh, accepting the fact that we're not experts. 
Um, and we start with the perspective that uh, the work we do is, is difficult. It needs a lot of input from a lot of smart people who have expertise in areas that we don't necessarily have, and we bring those people to bear on projects. Uh, it also starts, I'd say, by making sure we hire good people, people who actually are decent human beings. We incentivize them with very long-term compensation structures so that they're not shooting for the fences on day one and making short-term oriented decisions. Uh, we set a tone at the top around making sure that these projects, these investments will be around and with our name attached to them for multiple decades. Uh, and everything we do, we strive to enhance our reputation. We get it that we will not always be perfect, but we also understand that if we're gonna invest our money, our clients' money, often our clients are pension plans around the world, uh, and these, these folks are looking for that money to earn a reasonable return over a very long period of time, that we have to invest with a very long-term view, recognizing rules change, perceptions change, people's attitudes change, and therefore you have to be incrementalist and you have to be thoughtful and you have to bring experts into the field. Uh, and you have to be flexible as an organization that when those rules and those ideas change, that you can invest the capital to adjust your assets and your businesses to adapt, adopt that change. So we don't present, pretend to have a secret sauce or a secret formula, um, but that has been the ethos of this place. As I said, I, I started here in 2002. And since the first day, it was very much a long-term oriented approach to uh, generating value for us and our clients. Long-term is, is such a good way to put it. I mean, Wade, you've, you've visited many communities in the Americas. You've spent time there with indigenous peoples. Why, is, why are those long-term commitments important to establish relationships uh, and, and make sure that those communities know that uh, that you're there for the long term and that you care about them? Well, you know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that um, we, 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 I think there's a, what did we, what, what have we learned from COVID? This is so, so essential, Ryan. Uh, first of all, we're a biological species living on a biological planet. You know, a, a, a single pathogen, 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. Um, not only commandeered our own biology, it also attacked the bonds of community and connectivity that for a social species as we are, uh, are to us what teeth and claws represent to the jaguar. And, uh, and we saw the impact uh, of, of that. At the same time, we had to window onto both the impact we're having on the planet but also the resilience of the planet. I mean, you know, we haven't spoken enough about those extraordinary shots of the skies over Kathmandu clearing for the first time in two generations. You know, uh, wild boar in the streets of Barcelona, the Rio Medellin running through uh, Colombia's second largest city, turning overnight into something that would resemble a Rocky Mountain trout stream. Uh, the canals of Venice, the Cayman blackening the beaches of Baja. We saw the sheer resilience of the natural world. And one of the, the, the President Santos referred to this new book of mine, Magdalena, which is really a celebration of Columbia through the metaphor of the river that is to Columbia what the Mississippi is to the United States, both a corridor of commerce, but the fountain of culture. And the one theme that um, came to me from every citizen I met in the five years I researched that book, uh, exploring the entire uh, valley of the, of the Magdalena, was that the river is us and we are the river. And that if we wanna clean our soul in the wake of 50 years of conflict, we must also clean the river. And this is something so deep in the Colombian people that we're actually promoting the resurrection of the, of the Magdalena, not as an environmental issue, not as an environmental cause, but as a gesture of patrimony. Going way back to the time of the, the uh, uh, Bolivar and Humboldt, where Colombia was a country founded with a vision of natural history. And so that the act of desecrating a river becomes an act of, of treason in a sense, and the act of saving a river is an act of the purest form of patriotism. And again, the extraordinary thing about the planet is its resilience. You know, when I was a kid, you could tell the, 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 the kind of car that they're making at Terrytown on the, on the Hudson by the color of the river. In 1957, the River Thames in London was declared by the Natural History Museum biologically dead. There was no oxygen left in it. Today, there are 125 species of fish 
in the River Thames. Dolphins are seen beneath the bridges. Children can, can swim and, and families can picnic happily on the banks of the Hudson. Whales are seen at the mouth of the Hudson River from Manhattan. So, you know, these, these are the points of incredible optimism. And it also reflects the, the fact that people like Sachin, think of Sachin, I mean, his values, and it's so wonderful what he's been sharing with us today. It, it, he, he's not just working for this major investing uh, investor. He is a, a he is a human being who cares about the earth as much as anyone else does. And uh, we have to remember, you know, that, that when we were kids, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was an environmental victory. Nobody spoke about the biosphere or biodiversity. Now these terms are part of the vernacular of school children. So there is a tremendous possibility of optimism coming out of this pandemic. And we have to always remember that pessimism uh, is uh, uh, an insult to the imagination, despair, um, um, you know, the enemy of, of hope. You share that optimism, Sajjan? It's a, it's a, uh, it is a bright future in a lot of ways in terms of what, what the pandemic has offered us. I mean, we, we have an opportunity to change things here. To share uh, Wade's optimism on the Look, w without a doubt. First of all, uh, I would say myself in particular, but but our, our firm, we're a highly optimistic firm. I think anytime that you are in the business of trying to progress things, it's much easier to be optimistic than it is to be pessimistic. You'll, you will have people throw darts at you, but if you're doing the right things, you're doing them with the right values, uh, your objective is to progress and uplift communities uh, and to do things the right way, then you have to be optimistic at it. And that's why I said earlier, you have to take an incrementalist approach and an approach that's flexible. And you have to start from the premise that you don't know everything so that you can listen to others and make judgment calls along the way. And, and as Dr. Davis said, you know, even in 20 years, what we've seen in our business is what was right 18 years ago. We've made so much progress on ensuring that, you know, we've mitigated issues around fish uh, in rivers and ensuring that fish have spawning rights and proper areas to spawn. And we've invested capital to do that. Um, you know, clearing out branches on transmission lines to ensure that we mitigate forest fire impacts. Uh, work we do on roads and bridges to make sure they're stronger and safer for the local community. All of that evolves over time. And from our vantage point, you wanna be at the forefront of that in part because it makes you a better organization but also because the more you learn and the more that you can then bring that to bear to the next project, you are seen as an expert, you have built that institutional knowledge and that really sets you apart as an organization. So there's a personal motivation to doing it as well, but it's also good for the community that you're operating in. So we're highly optimistic. Uh, and if I take COVID as an example, COVID is just another example of an exogenous risk that nobody planned for. But now I can guarantee you for the next at least half decade, everyone will plan for as it relates to their businesses and their operations. And that will probably create better businesses that are more secure and stronger for the future. And that's a good thing. Yeah, risk and resilience is, uh, has suddenly become a, uh, a very popular couple of buzzwords in the context of ESG. It feels like uh, ESG was, uh, was old, old hat for Brookfield in, in, in many ways. I mean, when you start to think about future investments, what are what are the factors that you consider around uh, you know sustainability uh, and um, you know long, longer longer term uh, health for the planet? Is that a question for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say, look, I ran our uh, renewable power business for ten years uh, as the CEO of that business, and um, wh what I would say to you is. Uh, when I started in the business, we didn't even call it a renewable business. Renewable was a term that people coined on to us. We just got into hydro, wind, solar, and other non-fossil fuel-based forms of generation because as a long-term investor, we were worried that over a very long period of time, CO2 would become something that would hurt our reputation, number one, and number two, that governments could potentially tax around the world and would cause us an economic issue. So we went into it for both reputational and economic reasons. We went into avoiding that form of energy um, and all of a sudden it became the flavor of the day. And, uh, and I'd say, you know, that's an example in my view of when you have a long-term sustainable oriented approach to investing, 
you, you automatically start to think about, okay, how will this play out over 10 years, over 20 years? And we don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you that when, you're, when your term or your horizon to invest is informed by that type of timeline, you really do think about reputational implications, economic implications that could be out of your control, and you want to mitigate those as best as possible. So I think sustainability should be weaving into every aspect of investment people, business people, government's mindset. But it also has to be practical and realistic so that you can move the world forward. If we just fight about what is sustainable, nothing will get done. And it means that we need to bring experts from all fields together, make decisions, move forward, and accept that we might have to go back and revisit an old decision and change it if we were wrong. Uh, Wade, I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit. I mean, uh, Sajid mentioned moving forward. I think um, I think I, I just want to talk a bit about uh, biodiversity and and um, maybe the channel Mark Carney a little bit values. So, I mean, some of the most important things in the world are not valued at all. Uh, reefs, forests, fresh water. Um, and I guess I would channel Mark Carney again and asking, what what is, for you, Wade, what's the value of a pristine coastline? I mean, how do you ascribe value to these ecological assets? Because um, I think increasingly it's going to be important to do so. Well, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we, we forget, and I, I think, um, Ryan, if there's sort of a lesson from anthropology, it's, uh, you know, we, every culture is kind of myopic, faithful to their own interpretation of reality, you know, and, and we think of ourselves as being the real world and everybody else being a failed attempt at being modern, a failed attempt at being us. In fact, we represent just an intellectual tradition. And in our particular tradition, it's important to remember its roots. And as we attempted to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith, um, when Descartes said that all that existed is mind and matter, as we sort of, as Saul Bellow said, as science made a house cleaning of belief, when we swept away all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, metaphor, uh, and, and, and we created a, a world that was sort of a stage upon which only the human drama unfolded. And the, the idea, for example, that the flight of a bird could have meaning was reduced as ridiculous. Now, out of that, intellectual tradition of the enlightenment we got great things technology allopathic medicine the brilliance of science um, but at the same time we came to see a mountain as a pile of rock a forest as mere cellulose and bored feet and we forget that that kind of extractive perspective fundamental to our worldview is actually anomalous in the human experience. It's the exception, not the norm. And when you look around the world, most societies in most places have their established relationship with the natural world being based much more on notions of reciprocity. The simple idea that the earth owes its bounty to people, people in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. People are never the problem, we're always the solution because it's only through human uh, activity that we can maintain the, some would say the energetic flows of the earth and some in some cosmological visions and so on. But the, the main point is that that notion of reciprocity is something that we want to get back to because we now realize that we do live on a finite planet. You know, if you took the most amazing thing about being on Mount Everest, Ryan, is the realization that you can get up in the morning, strap on your boots, have your breakfast, and by your own a um, uh, uh, motor uh, skills walk to a point where oxygen deprivation is so uh, extreme that you cannot breathe. Now, if that doesn't tell you how thin the veil of the biosphere is, the, the, the entire biosphere is 12 and a half miles deep. You know, imagine putting it horizontal, how quickly you could drive a car 12 and a half miles. And so that vision of the earth from space that came back to us from Apollo will be spoken about 10,000 years from now as that moment when we really saw what we really were. And so in that sense, you know, if we began to see a mountain, not just as a pile of rock, but as a deity, or if we saw a forest as the abode of spirits, as people do in the Northwest coast, I'm not suggesting that we go back to a pre-industrial past, but when we realize that a people who see a mountain as a living being are going to have a different relationship to it than those who simply see it as a pile of rock. If you see the forest as just cellulose, as I did growing up as a logger, you'll have a different relationship to it than 
a people who believe this domain of the spirits. Again, not to say that we should give up the industrial world or that anyone should be kept from the brilliance and genius of modernity, but that kind of subtle shift in perspective and, and awareness and appreciation of the finite nature of this blue planet of ours could really be useful in informing industrial decisions and social and political decisions about how we we actually seek a world that is truly sustainable and and maintaining the biodiversity um, uh, in all of its bounty I, I with due respect i think that's a, a fabulous way to look at things but most people would say we're running out of time to make those decisions i mean what are we, we and it's not uh in many cases it's not up to, to me and you it's up to political leadership to uh and to a certain extent, business uh, businesses to make those changes. I mean, what are the well, things we, that we need we're, to do? We're, 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 we're running out of time, but also in a kind of optimistic things, things have moved so quickly. You know, as I, as I said, if, if, you, if, if you consider the attitudes that we had, uh, even in my youth, the, it, it seems, it feels like looking back across, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, millennia, Right. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we can make these changes quickly. I mean, look, look what Sachin just said about the who would have guessed that that um, uh, non carbon based energy sources uh, would have come to the fore, both both practically uh, uh, and economically as they have done. I mean, who would have guessed in my youth that we would really be saying that coal is dead because coal is dead. Um, so I, again, I, I think we're impatient with the pace of history. Yes, it never is fast enough for us, but it moves awfully fast. And, you know, um, and that to me is, is the grounds for optimism. I mean, look, when I was a kid, not one, one government in the world had a ministry of environment. Now, there isn't one that does not. Now, how efficient they are is another thing. But the point is that the pendulum of history is moving toward the, 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 the realm of sustainability. It has to, and um, uh, much will be lost before we get there. But I think we're literally living through a, 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 a transformative era that people will look back on um, uh, 10,000 years from now and say, this, this was the moment when humanity, in a sense, um, shifted in a way that literally led to its salvation. Are, are there still barriers to the kind of collaboration that we need to to make these changes? I mean, do you, do you see any any barriers in, in your work, uh, Sachin, and how do you uh, help overcome those uh, towards, uh, you know, making those investments count? Yeah, look, I, I think there's always barriers to large scale investment. You know, capital is a barrier, expertise is a barrier, government regulations can be barriers or they can be additive. Uh, so there's always barriers. I don't think the idea that, I don't think the solution is to break down barriers. I think it's making sure that uh, between regulation, capital, communities, and expertise, they all work hand in hand to move the, whatever the objective of the day is forward. And, uh, and I think if people expect perfection or zero, as the two outcomes. And if they expect a binary outcome, nothing gets solved in life. You know, and I look at it like, just take your own self. If you wanted to create a new habit, any kind of habit, you're gonna fail five times before it's a habit. You're gonna keep tweaking it away. People who wanna go to the gym give up all the time. And if you can't hold yourself to that standard, how can you hold humanity to that standard? And so I look at it more like, are we moving humans forward a little bit along what, you know, Dr. Davis is saying? And I. At work, we talk about this all the time. I have teams and sometimes people get negative about these barriers. And I always give them the, the 1975 test, which is if somebody passed away in 1975 and you could miraculously bring them back to life today, they wouldn't recognize the planet we're on. And that's only 45 years ago. Yeah. Because yeah. of all the progress we've had, that person wouldn't recognize a single thing. They wouldn't recognize our forms of communication, our forms of energy, our desire to have green and socially conscious investing. None of that existed in our lifetime. And therefore, um, you know, we should be positive about this. We do need to move things forward, but we can't expect binary outcomes. You know, if I could just jump in there, Ryan, I so lo yeah. love what Sasha just said, because another sort of thought experiment about this is just consider the world 
of your great grandfather and the certitudes of that pre World War I era. What was thought about race? What was thought about women? Um, uh, you, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the superiority of the white male was accepted with such um, uh, reflex that there wasn't even a word for colonialism or racism in the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, the, 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 you, you go down all the line about what people actually believed, and there's not one of those moral certitudes that you would concur with t today. And in fact, many of the certitudes of that era we would see as morally reprehensible. And yet they existed, and they were, they were, they were clung to with, with great um, uh, fidelity by that entire generation. Um, you know, poverty was a co was 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 um, the responsibility of the poor. Even though the British Army discovered in 1914 that the average height of an enlisted man was six inches shorter than an officer, strictly on nutrition alone, race was fixed. You know, um, the role of women. You can go on and on and on. And yet now we 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 live in a kind of a social realm of of the dreams of those who shook that up in anthropology in fact you know who shattered the european paradigm you know it was a sociological equivalent of splitting the atom but the point is the world we live in today is so unrecognizable to what our grandparents so so that shows you the 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 pace of true transformative change it's uh it's remarkable i mean that just in listening to you wade and, and sachin there's there's an entirely new uh, taxonomy about how we discuss these issues. Uh, you know, we, we hear things like ESG. I, I'd also just like to hear your views on the notion of, of net zero and, and why that is an important uh, for, for governments, uh, but also for companies. And, you know, also the importance of accountability uh, and transparency in getting to those, to those net zero goals. Why don't you go ahead and start, Sachin? Sure. You know, net, net zero uh, is another sort of term of the day, uh, which just five years ago didn't exist. So it's a really good example of, you know, progress in holding a standard that people want to achieve. And, and the point of net zero is, if you look at the last hundred years in society, as we've started to measure climate, uh, we've noticed that the world has warmed up by one degree. And there is a fear that with continuing to do things as we have without making changes around reduction in CO2 emissions, that the world will continue to warm up going forward. And once we hit two degrees, there are models that will say there will be calamity, you know, shorelines that will be disrupted uh, and significant geographic disruption. And therefore, net zero is an attempt by the world and stakeholders of the world, so governments, corporations, but also people, in our decisions that we make every day to help reduce that or slow down that warming of the planet. And what's happened as a result is many companies, organizations, institutions, governments have come out with objectives on what they're going to do to reduce net zero. Uh, and that could be, you know, reducing waste if you have an industrial business it could be in investing in carbon capture systems it could be investing in green electricity you know the the bottom line is the bulk of our co2 today comes from energy and electricity 70 percent greater than 70 percent really comes from the form of energy we use to power the world so we need to transform energy if we're going to really make a dent in that one percent there's a whole bunch of other nice to haves but if you right. start with energy you really get to the heart of the problem. And that means that we have to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel based forms of energy, whether that be energy that's coming through oil and gas or whether that becomes energy from electricity sources. And uh, for, from our vantage point at Brookfield, as I said, you know, we started investing in renewable power, not even calling it renewable uh, many years ago. We feel that that's a great starting point for us to continue to invest in this solution. But it also means that for the existing businesses that we do own today that actually do contribute CO2 into the atmosphere, we have to come up with plans on how we're going to measure that CO2, how we're going to mitigate that CO2, and then be committed to putting in the capital, the people, the expertise to actually bring it down. And 2050 is the period where everybody has agreed that would be a target 
that companies be held accountable to. So that's net zero for us. We're trying to take a very practical approach to it. We're trying to bring what we can to it, which is expertise in investing and capital. Um, but obviously everyone has a role to play. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's going to take a whole world solution uh, to this problem. Wade, what do you think? How do people... Well, yeah, they, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I just uh, I so enjoyed this conversation with all both of you. Um, you know, Stuart Brand uh, once said to me, you know, he became an advocate of nuclear power because he said, you know, nuclear is a problem when things go terribly wrong. Coal is a problem when things goes, go just as planned. And, and indeed, you know, if you think about it, the, the whole climate crisis is based on one thing, that for 300, only 300 years, we've been living on the ancient sunlight of the world. And one of the things about climate change is it may have become humanity's problem, but we should remember it wasn't caused by humanity. It was caused by one relatively narrow subset of humanity with this particular industrial uh, paradigm. And one of the things that I find very poignant around the world is that indigenous people who played no role in causation um, are re responding in ways that from terms of reference of their societies are in fact more proactive than much of what we're doing. But the other point to make is that for us, climate change may be a technical challenge, an economic opportunity, even in some quarters, a political debate, whatever. We forget that for the vast majority of peoples of the world, who view human beings as being responsible for the well-being of the world, climate change is a profoundly psychological crisis. It's an existential crisis because if the world suffers, it is their fault. There's a famous pilgrimage in Peru that for over Lord knows how many years, certainly well into pre-Columbian times, um, individuals from all over the Southern Andes would make their way to a sacred valley dominated by the tongues of three glaciers. And they after the arrival of Christianity, it became syncretic and they would bring the ch uh, crosses from their local churches up on their backs to plant in the ice to absorb the power of Pachamama for three days and then reinvent, I mean, re-energize um, the community for the coming year, a beautiful three-day ritual. The penultimate stage of the ritual was the chipping away of small blocks of ice that would be carried back to the communities all through the southern andes so that the elders who were too frail to participate in the um in the ritual could be part of the sacred circle of the divine if you will but watching the recession of those glaciers the people have unilaterally stopped that trivial chipping of ice because they think they're responsible for the recession of the glaciers and of course that little bit of ice was incidental but you begin to see these things and you see how poignant it can be the response of indigenous people and that's why we have such a responsibility to get this under control but we will as Sachin said by 2050 you know it's you can just feel it happening you know I mean you can feel it happening I mean 15 years ago climate change was just still you know a, a thing that was discussed at conferences now it's on the on the lips of school children so i i i, I we're going to get on top of this and there's one final point to make uh, give us a little bit of humility is always to remember that if you took the entire hominid lineage i mean not just going back to our progenitor homo erectus all the way back to homo afarensis 2.4 million years ago and you take that entire lineage and put it on a 24-hour clock of the history of the earth our entire human presence would not occupy a second. So in other words, our presence is ephemeral. The question is, the planet will survive. The question is, will it be a place where we would want to uh, bequeath it to our children? Uh, we're, we're getting into uh, some incredible territory here. I, and uh, I wanna make sure that we get to uh, some audience questions, but also uh, one question in particular, and it comes from, uh, Jaime Lopez, uh, who is the managing director at Santander, uh, Banco Santander. Uh, we go to uh, Jaime for his question. Hi, everyone. Thank you to the council for giving Santander the opportunity to participate on this great event. And congratulations to both Sachin and Dr. Davis for their respective awards and the insightful discussions today. My question is for both Sachin and Wade, and it's about the future. How do you see the pace of embracing sustainability in Latin America? Is it accelerating? Will it be subject to specific triggers or events? Thanks in advance. 
Sure. Thanks, Ame. I can start. Um, I would say it's absolutely accelerating. Uh, the world is an amazingly connected place. So it's not like Latin America is an island unto itself. And, uh, and therefore, it is both, you know, projecting its values onto the world and then also absorbing the values of the world back into, uh, into the hemisphere. And uh, what we've seen uh, is that uh, for many of the reasons that were laid out at the outset of this conference, it's, nat it's natural beauty, it's topography, the geography is uh, unbelievable across uh, the Southern Hemisphere and in Latin America. The, the environment and people's connection to the environment is very deep. And so we're seeing sustainability, not only was it strong 20 years ago, I can speak for myself now, 20 years ago it was very strong when, we, when I first started to get experience to the region. I'd say it's much stronger today and leading on a global scale. Uh, and and in spite of the fact that it's a region where infrastructure is maybe needed more so than many other parts of the world, the desire to have infrastructure, again, from our vantage point, that is sustainable, can be there for the long term and is additive to communities and has a strong environmental bent to it is, is deep. And the perfect example is Brazil. You know, we've, we've seen in Brazil the proliferation of wind and solar projects all around the country, even though the country has rich, rich hydro resources and historically had a little bit of coal, coal has largely been phased out. No new coal is being built in the country. Uh, and uh, e even the small amount of gas that's in the country has largely been static for about a decade now. And all new forms of generation are either low impact, small hydro, wind up in the Northeast in Bahia, or solar spread out throughout the country and in particular in the south where people live. Colombia, where we invested in Isahen, I mean, and, and we met at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Colombia, although it has amongst the richest hydro resources in the world again, uh, and we bought what was largely a hydro based business, we've been building out wind and solar across the countryside in Colombia as well because the governments push and really communities push to have environmentally sustainable resources providing the electricity for the next 50 years. So I, I think the sustainability push is gonna grow. It's very deep in the region uh, and I'm, I'm very positive on it. Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, just what Sashin said about the connectivity of the world. You know, we forget that when I was a schoolboy and went to Cali, as the president mentioned, 1968, but well into the 1970s, the vast majority of North Americans had never been in on an airplane. And one, the Colombians had. I mean, one of the curious and wonderful things about Colombia, it was the first nation state to truly embrace air travel as a, as a, as a legitimate uh, way of creating a transportation uh, uh, infrastructure, in part because of the topography of the country. But that's why Avianca is, what, the second large, oldest airline in the world. But again, back to Colombia. You know, this is a, I remember even in the early 70s as a young student, you know, I'd almost have to, it was like a different, pl it, it was like we were different than they were. There was a chasm between us in the pop culture and in reference points or whatever. Well, today Bogota is New York. Um, today we have two generations of Colombians uh, forced to flee the conflict who are returning from every capital in the world with skill sets in every conceivable vocation, uh, ready to set up their country on the, on the brink of an economic renaissance that's unimaginable in its potential. And you get in Colombia what, what I, I consider kind of the, the hippest, most cutting edge in every single endeavor. And so this is part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the capital uh, of, of the nation. Uh, and and these values are have become global values um, in the same way that the pandemic has become a a, a global uh, plague. You know there there is this ongoing sense that 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 climate is not a localized issue by definition, of course. So you know there's there's great hope to be found in the connectivity of the institutions, the, the liaisons between scientists, the, the 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 values that my daughters share. Uh, are the same values that my Colombian friends share. Now, also countries change, consciousness change. You know, when I first in 1974 would go to live with the Arawakos, the legendary elder brothers in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, parents of my friends at the National University in Bogota would say, ¿Por qué quiere vivir con la, gente, con la gente sucia? Why do you want to live with the dirty people? Well, today, five Colombian presidents as a first act of office before taking on the mantle of the presidency have made their first act 
a journey to the Sierra to pay homage to the Mamos who have emerged as symbols of continuity and patrimony in a nation that's been in conflict. So the, the, the pace of change, the, the, the shifting of awareness, um, uh, the, the role of, of the environment, uh, the respect for the environment uh, in Colombia. Of course, there are challenges and, and there are problems, um, uh, but, but the, the, the overall shift in awareness and values and priorities is really, I think, a global phenomena. Well, thank, thank you, Jaime, for, uh, for your question. Thank you so much. Uh, I, we have about five minutes remaining, and I do think it's important to get to a couple of the, uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, this may be uh, the final question, I'm not sure, but we'll, I, I throw it to both of you. And um, essentially it's this, uh, how do you deal with investments in countries that may not share the concern uh, about environment and sustainable, uh, sustainability issues? Uh, Sachin, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, look, for, first of all, I, I'd start from the premise that if you ask anyone in a country of their views, they're never going to say, we don't share your views. They'll always say they, they do. Uh, so I think from our vantage point, um, look, track record matters. Uh, we want to invest in countries that have a general track record of doing the right thing, doing the right thing from a regulatory perspective, doing the right thing from uh, a rule of law perspective, having a respect for capital, uh, institutions that are strong and functioning and that give independence to a judiciary system and to regulatory bodies. And if we can find those types of countries, we accept the fact that from time to time, there may be bumps along the road. They might have periods of time where regimes change and, and ultimately you get, you know, a regime that maybe isn't as positive on something versus the prior one. But over the long term, that rule of law and the culture that's been created by that people will persist and will endure. And, and so from our vantage point, that really guides how we think about investing in two countries, as opposed to what does the government of the day say publicly or doesn't say publicly about one topic. That we just don't make decisions based on that. Wait, same, same question to you. Well, I, I, I think, you know, Sachin is, is a much more important voice on this because obviously his company is in the front lines involved on, on, on levels of scale that really can shift the global dial. Uh, I, I'm fundamentally a storyteller, a writer, and I tell stories. And what I do is um, go after those who are responsible for poor practices as earnestly as I go after those to celebrate them who are, who are responsible for good practices. And as I said earlier, I never assume that some sector of the economy is, is um, uh, uniformly good or bad. It's the players within that section. And that's why, you know, to, to I suppose to some, to the horror of some of my colleagues, I've been a huge champion of, of, of Hunt Consolidated because I saw what Mr. Hunt did and I saw what his values really were. The only problem, frankly, on that story of the Hunt Consolidated was that because they were a privately held company, they didn't want publicity. We were all about to blow their horn, celebrate them across the world, forcing other players in the, in the uh, oil and gas sector, in Peru in particular, to up their, up their game, if you will. Uh, but the only thing that kept us from really doing that as efficiently as we wanted to was Mr. Hunt's somewhat reluctance to have publicity because he was privately held. But I mean, what a wonderful situation that you had the man who invented the term biodiversity desperately trying to celebrate the positive actions of a man who had just built the largest LNG plant and pipeline in the history of South America. And that's the kind of collaboration we want, free of ideology, free of polemics, focused on solutions, a transparent and, and, and an atmosphere in which we truly celebrate those. Uh, like my friend Ross Beatty, who's probably the biggest environmentalist in Canada, who's endowed the Biodiversity Center at UBC, who's done more for the environmental, supports the David Suzuki Foundation more than anyone. And he's an owner of silver mines. And you know his silver mines are good silver mines that's that's to me the model of of corporate investment that i would like to see i i think we've got time just for one more question and i it, it will coalesce a, a bunch of questions from the audience but uh, i think wade you bringing up the idea of this focus on solutions 
and just um, the positivity generally of our discussion. And I, I do, I, I work in the climate space. I always try and end these things on a positive note. What, what makes you hopeful for the future? Um, uh, and I throw that out to, to, to each of you. Uh, I think there is a lot to be hopeful for, but I, I want to hear from you, uh, Sajid. Uh, sure. You know, we, we touched on it a little bit, but look, I, um, I see it through my kids. You know, I have two little girls in school and they're in grade school and they have a much more sophisticated understanding of the environment, our place in it, what's right versus what's wrong in a very comprehensive perspective than I would have had at that age. And that I'm sure my parents would have had at that age. Uh, and therefore that is progress. If the next generation can be better than we are, and I see it with the young, young people, not kids, the young people we hire into our firm, who come into our firm uh, with a view of being a positive force in society, um, much more so than just making money. And I think those are all good things. Those, that is the sign that the world is moving in the right direction um, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and, and so it, I'm very positive because I see it every day. I see the work we do. I see how if people put their minds together and invest time into solutions and be solutions oriented rather than throwing darts, um, so much gets done. And we've been able to accomplish so much because as an organization, we've taken that very solutions oriented approach to everything that we do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I would say I'm optimistic because people like Sashin are in the world. Uh, you know, uh, at the helm of a major investment company like that with the values that he shared with us today. How can you not be optimistic to know that individuals like that are actually making these kinds of decisions? And also what Sachin said about being a father. How can you be a father and not be optimistic, right? And I, as I said earlier, to me, pessimism is simply a, an indulgence, uh, despair and insult to the imagination, just as orthodoxy is the enemy of invention. We have to do what needs to be done and only then ask whether it was possible or even permissible. Uh, you know, Jim Whitaker, the, the first American to climb Everest, once said that if you're, if you're not uh, living on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. Well, I, I, would, I would adapt that to say that we as a society, as a civilization, are at a point where if we're not prepared to go to the edge of the precipice and realize that if we leap off, we will land not on rocks, but a feather bed, as long as we do it with, with, um, with sincerity and, and uh, honor and decency, uh, uh, then, then, then the future looks very bright indeed. Sincerity, honesty, uh, decency. Thank you, Wade. Thank you. Sajin, um, this has been a great conversation. I really, uh, I'm really have, it's been a pleasure to be a part of it. So uh, thank you both. Uh, we'll, we'll have to leave it there and thank you to the CCA for, uh, for bringing me on board and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. And of course, thank you, uh, Sajin and Wade. We expected and hoped for intellectual sparks and that's exactly what we got. And CCA will continue to present programs with people from diverse backgrounds converging and what the process of converging on this critical issue of our time sustainability. Um, with that, again, I would like to thank our gala sponsors uh, for their generous support uh, in putting this program together. Uh, without that support, um, we could not be able to do what we do either today or the other 364 days a year. On behalf of everybody listening uh, at the CCA, I'd like to thank everybody for listening today and for your continued support. For those who would like to see a video of this program, we expect it will be posted soon on our YouTube channel and linked through our website at ccacanada.com. With that, my thanks to our panelists, my congratulations to our award winners. Have a good rest of your day and we'll see you again shortly. Thank you.